guys, Joe here at ECRM's Euro Beauty Week in Barcelona, and I'm here with Eric from Pacino Sig Signature Line. Thanks again for joining us. No problem, thank you for having me, appreciate it. So one of the things that I want to talk about today is leveraging social media and leveraging your brand to kind of help drive sales of your products. And Eric's got a really interesting story because he's got a huge following on social media, but uh, can you talk a little bit about the roots of that and how that all started? All right, so um, when I first started cutting hair, I started off as a barber, by the way. Uh, so I was a barber just cutting hair in my mother's garage and uh, just going to high school. I got out of high school and uh, found myself in the Navy. I was in the Navy for four years, and while I was in the Navy, I was still cutting hair. Once I got out the Navy, uh, I was now in my early 20s. And by that time, no social media, no YouTube, no nothing. And uh, a couple years later, I started meeting some buddies of mine that were a little bit younger than, than myself. And they were into AOL, you know, the whole dial-up thing. And they were telling me about it. I'm like, an email? What's that? So I, had no, so I was out of it. So uh, for me, it was just kind of something brand new. And, uh, you know, we always hung out. Before you know it, they're like, hey, this cool thing came out called MySpace. And I was like... What's that all about? Wow. Now, we, you know you're dating us, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I got to give you the roots of it because yep, yep. at the end of the day, whoever's watching this, you know, depending on how old they are, it's like you could kind of like go back and really understand how this all started literally. Yep. And so uh, at the time, I had just got a gig uh, cutting Puff Daddy. Uh, I had cut Jay-Z sometimes. I actually cut him for one of his album covers. So I was cutting a couple different celebrities here and there. And I literally remember... Like going with the uh, yellow box Kodak, where you have to just sh sh like yep, turn it all I remember the way those. around, right? Yep. You have to keep turning to take your next picture. And I remember one time taking it with me on a trip. I think we went to like, I don't know, Saint Tropez or something like that in France with Puff Daddy. And I remember having a couple guys like, hey, do you mind just taking a quick picture of me and him while I'm finishing this haircut? They're like, yeah, no problem. So, so I developed them, the, uh, the images, and then I showed my friend. And I was like, hey, you know. What do you think about these pictures? He's like, man, you should really upload upload those to uh, your MySpace account. So I was like, I don't have a MySpace account. So he was like, hey, no problem, man. I'll build it out for you. I was like, all right, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Before you know it, I started getting this, you know, pretty good following of uh, new barbers that were starting to come on the scene. Which at that point in time, it was not cool to have a big beard. It was not cool to have like your beard etched up or your eyebrows done mm -hmm. or your eyelashes, whatever. Excuse me, eyebrows actually. Uh, so getting detailed haircuts was still a very, very undiscovered tap market. And uh, for me, I was a barber. I was probably, at the time, probably one of the youngest barbers you would see out there because the typical barber at the time was an older gentleman. Mm -hmm. And so for me, again, this whole digital space was so brand new to me, but I started to realize like I was getting all these different messages and people congratulating me from all different parts of the United States. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was pretty interesting. And then fast forward, Facebook comes out, and again, I'm like so stuck on MySpace, I don't even want to go to Facebook. Yeah. And they're like, no, you got to go to Facebook. And I'm like, all right, well, here goes again my best friend. Like, don't worry, I'll build it up for you. I was like, oh, okay, I appreciate it. Just build it up. So he builds out my Facebook, that starts to grow. So I'm happy with Facebook now, right? A couple years later, all of a sudden, this Instagram thing comes out. Yeah. He's like, man, you need an Instagram. I'm like, man, like, what are you doing to me? It's like, I don't care about this stuff. At the time, I think I had like a Nokia flip phone. He's like, no, you got to get this sidekick. You're able to see your accounts now. I'm like, a sidekick? So again, I'm literally going through this timeline of how all of a sudden, while all this is happening, I'm collecting followers from MySpace, Facebook, now following on to Instagram. And the unique part about Instagram, it was a nice thread where you could continue just to scroll yeah. and see images. So it was a lot better than Facebook in the sense that it was real quick, you just were able to see the yeah. picture. And, at the and time, it's really made for visual. It's a visual platform. Right. Yeah. So yeah. then at that point, it was like videos weren't out yet, but my images mm -hmm. were so, you know, capturing from haircuts that I was doing to uh, different celebrities that I was cutting. And so that's what started to capture the attention of just not other, other bar not only other barbers in the United States, but literally globally. Yeah. And so from there, it's like, you know, I started to get some type of following. Mm -hmm. And uh, fast forward to like, I think 2000 and now, man, maybe 11 or 12, uh, I said, you know what? I'm gonna come out with like my own razor blade. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I uh, private labeled my own razor blade, put my name on it. And again, I asked my best friend, I was like, hey, you know, I know you know about computers, you know how to build out a little website? He's like, yeah, yeah no problem, I'll take care of that. I was like, let's put this little razor on there and see what it does. 
He was like, how many do you have? I said, well, I had to order a thousand of them. I said, because that was the MLQ. I said, but if it doesn't sell, it's no problem. So we put it on there and I just did a quick post about it. Like, hey, just came out with my own signature razor. Uh, if you like it, uh, I think you didn't have a link yet. I told him, I said, go to this website yeah. and purchase it. And Literally, that was on Instagram. On Instagram. On Instagram, yeah. Literally, probably within the first couple of hours, we literally sold out. <laughs> and then that's when I was like, okay. So, mm. yeah, I was mm. like, all right, now you know what? I have to start getting a little bit more strategic about, you know, what I come out with next. Mm. And uh, the part I didn't, I never got to was the fact that when I first started my barbering career, I always imagined and pictured myself of one day having my own gel. Okay. Right? And I remember even going to Walmart stores and seeing everything that they had on there. And I was like, man, I know I could mm -hmm. do better packaging. I know I could do better marketing for it because I felt like I was in touch with my clients yeah. and I knew who my client was. Mm -hmm. And some of their products, with all due respect to some of the brands, they just did not understand the different hair textures or anything of that nature. And I was like, man, they're they're not making the right product for the average client. You yeah. know? So, and uh, certainly, the, you, know, you'll have, you have a much deeper understanding because of your history as a barber. 110%. So that's when I said, okay, I think now is the time for me to really come out with my own product and leverage it through my Instagram slash my e-commerce. Mm -hmm. I said, if let's say a big retail store is not going to give somebody like myself a chance, a little old barber, I might as well just do this myself. Yeah. So then that's basically what I ended up doing. I just started to formulate my own products and I started putting those online. And uh, again, my followers started to purchase it. Yep. So then my next step was not just to uh, rely on my digital marketing, mm -hmm. but I also did a lot of guerrilla marketing. So what I ended up doing was going city to city, almost as if I was now this you know, artist mm -hmm. going on tour, singing at you know, stadiums, but instead it was just, I was renting literally small event spaces at hotels in each city and just announcing it through my social media page. Hey, I'm gonna be in Chicago, I'm gonna be in New York, I'm gonna be in LA. If you'd like to come to my seminars on how I can teach you how to cut hair, show up. I thought we would rent them out for only 50 people. Mm -hmm. It was like standing room only, like wow. literally, wow. we'd have a couple hundred people just show up. Yeah. And some of them weren't even barbers showing up. It was just general public that was mm -hmm. following me that wanted to learn a little bit more about these intricate, detailed haircuts. That For their were, own style. Of practices. course, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So then that's when, again, you know, I would bring my products along, sell them, and then I caught the attention of a gentleman that works for a distribu distribution company that uh, has access to uh, Target stores. Okay. And so he was very interested in what I was doing, and uh, they reached out to me. And we had a meeting, they asked me if I was interested in possibly aligning myself with Target. I said, like, Target, the store Target, like the circle yep. with the yeah. dot, like the one that, like, yeah. my parents and my friends' parents go and shop at, like, that store. And they're like, yeah. I was like, okay, why not? Give it a shot. So they put us on Target.com. And again, I went back towards my social media mm -hmm. and leveraged it as, as um, making sure that all of my following was going to Target.com yeah. to purchase the products now. And uh, when Target saw that, they saw the sales, they gave us a test market of like 52 stores. Mm -hmm. And uh, we knocked that out the park, thank God. Again, leveraging my social mm -hmm. to go to these particular stores to buy the product. And they little by little started to ramp us up. This was about maybe two and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And now we're in uh, a little bit over 1,500 stores nationwide. Wow. And then that's right about the time when we met yes. over in Budapest, and right? Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. so then... When you were looking to expand into ex more. Ex yeah. So then what started happening through my e-commerce, mm -hmm. we're looking at the analytics and I'm telling my sales team, well, I guess now we could call them my sales team, but at the time it was uh, a buddy of mine that I hired and he was just like our graphic designer at mm -hmm. first, right? So then, you know, we're all talking and I'm just like, man, like, look at these numbers coming through my e-commerce. Like, yeah. we had Germany with crazy sales, uh, France, Italy. I'm like, you guys need to get in touch with these distributors. Yeah. And what I'm, and what I'm able to do organically just with you know, my website, my e-commerce, I know I could duplicate that mm -hmm. once we start going into retail stores the same way I was able to do it with, um, with Target stores. Yeah. And so then uh, that's when our graphic designer at the time started going on the hunt. And mm -hmm. then that's when he found you guys. And he's okay. like, hey, take a look at this company. And I'm like, look, and I'm like, let me see. Let me see the video again. And so then all of a sudden one day, it was like a Sunday. I was like, 
I called him. I was like, man, you need to come over. We need to sit down and like really watch all these YouTube videos. Okay. Which is yourself. The one that you found. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And you had like all your hacks. You know, you guys were under, like, doing all the hacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, man, I love these guys. I was like, I was like, let's just invest into it. Go out there and see what we get out yeah. of it. You know. And for those of you who may not have seen our previous video, what he's referring to is me and Timothy Bush. Uh, a colleague of mine put together a series of videos called Supplier Hacks yeah. with tips and tricks on how to get the most from your ECRM experience. So, and that's how we met with it. He came up to me uh, and he actually listed all of them, I have them studied up. them, and applied them. I so, yeah, I literally still to this day mm -hmm. have that notebook yeah. with all 17 hacks, I think, mm -hmm. yep. and wrote them all down. And, uh, you know, one of the things about myself, it's like uh, I'm, I'm a big observer mm -hmm. and I like to try to always do like my due diligence on, you know, just market research and what is this all about before I invest into anything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I literally invested into you guys because yeah. if it wasn't for you actually just making that YouTube video and explaining, you know, the, uh, the um, you know, the pros of coming to an ECRM event, I probably would have been skeptical. I'm like, ah, there's not enough yeah. information about yeah. it. So I think this all goes back to uh, nowadays the uh, the uh, authenticity, the yeah. uh, organicness of a brand, mm -hmm. any brand, where you could actually like really see them and and feel their passion behind whatever it is that they're trying to sell or whatever message they're trying to put out. Mm -hmm. And that was the reason why I invested and I took a trip to Prague. I had never been to Prague. Yeah, and me was, either. That time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so yeah. when I walked in and I saw you, I thought I was seeing this celebrity. I was like, yeah, oh, me, man. Yeah, I mean, he's talking. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm serious. I was like, man, there goes that guy from the YouTube video. And then I told uh, Christian, I was like, man, I got to go say something to him. He's like, all right, go ahead. And you were eating dinner. I was like, man, I don't mean to bother you. So I let you know. I watch your YouTube stuff. I really appreciate it because I really enjoy uh, paying homage and, yeah. and saying yeah. thank you. Uh, to anyone that I feel that has helped me in any mm. which way or form, so. No, well, much appreciated, and, and actually that's what I'm doing now because of what you're doing on social media. Uh, you know, we talk a lot at uh, our company and the, the different programs that we do about the importance of uh, leveraging influencers, but I think there's a big difference between leveraging an influencer that you're paying for yeah. and making yourself an influencer. Yeah. And that's where, you know, I think it's so much more powerful to do what you do. I mean, that's what we do at ECRM. Yeah. I was like, you know what, why work with somebody else when we can just do it? You don't need a degree to be an no. influencer. You don't need a certification. You just have to go and do it, be yourself. And that's what you're doing. So now, how do you work the two together? I see you have amazing videos. I love the video you just did with beard. the dude with the cup. Yeah. And he's so it's a guy with a scraggly beard and he's drinking a cup of coffee mm -hmm. and he puts his hand out and then someone puts a coin yeah. in it because he looks like a bomb and then he goes and gets his beard done. But the way you integrate your products and your, you know, into Product funny content. content. Mm -hmm. yep. And so talk a little bit about that. How what's your kind of strategy or philosophy or, you know, it in creating your social media content. Okay, all right, so I'm gonna drop some gems. Um, I'm gonna also leave a PayPal account so you guys can, no, <laughs> no, but I'm gonna, I'll be honest with you, okay. uh, real quick, getting back to the whole influencer thing, um, a lot of times it becomes very intimidating when you see other mm -hmm. influencers, right? But the reality is, if you stick to who you really are and you just get out there in front of the camera and do what you do, You'll be so surprised how people actually latch on to that, yeah. right? Sometimes they see other people that are influencers and it's like they try to copy what they look like, what they're wearing, mm -hmm. how they're speaking, what are they doing. And the reality is people buy into people because of who they are. Mm -hmm. So if you ever want to be a so-called quote-unquote influencer, which I don't even think an influencer these days is an influencer. It's just real people that believe in yeah. other real people, right? So, uh, but now fast forwarding to what you were asking me. Uh, a little bit ago here. So how do you basically integrate the two worlds mm -hmm. basically? Yeah. So for me, why well, not just integrate it, but in regards to how do you create good content for people to want to watch, right? I've always tried to put myself as the consumer. What would draw my attention mm -hmm. to someone try to sell a product? So if you try to make a video that's too cool for school, guess what? People aren't into it. Mm -hmm. So you have to be as organic as possible. Uh, you have to try to come up with some creative content, some creative ideas mm -hmm. where people might want to watch it, right? So uh, in my meetings, I actually show the uh, the buyers the type of UGC content that we make. Mm -hmm. the, the fact that now you have to understand the algorithm of an Instagram yeah. 
where you know the first three or four seconds if you don't capture your audience they're gonna keep scrolling yeah. right yeah. so it's all these little things that you have to keep in the back of your mind when you're creating a video so sometimes even just the default pick mm -hmm. right the thumbnail that picture or that image that you could see on the explore page has to have some type of attention draw to it where you're like wait what's this all about you know mm -hmm. so sometimes we make believe like the guy's gonna cut his hair off so we'll tell the client like hey make a crazy face as if i'm about to yeah. cut all your hair off and that video will go viral and okay because they see that face in the first three seconds exactly yeah. or yeah. sometimes they'll just see the thumbnail and yeah. they'll be curious to see what is this all about you know yeah. so you know a lot of times you just have to understand and and again like i said before i'm a I'm, i am an observer so when i go on social media and i see what's been working i analyze all right that worked for them this worked for them so how can i get inspiration pull inspiration from that and then i start to get into my thoughts and say all right you know what this is what we should do but i also again spend money on uh you know a budget for um a freelancing uh videographer photographers mm -hmm. so to the brand we have the UGC but then we also have the professional content so mm -hmm. I think you have to have a balance of both because you can't grow a brand just based off of all UGC and all this like crazy funny or uh, different type of UGC content. is that's your organic content? Yeah so UGC sorry UGC is basically user generated content okay. so and the other thing is I try to tell people when they ask me oh so what do you do for a living when they first just meet me so I tell them well I started off as a barber Mm -hmm. And then I start, and then I went into being an entrepreneur, and now I'm actually I feel like I'm a digital marketer. Yeah. Because I literally would sit there all night just YouTube and videos about how to grow my brand. What can I do different? Mm -hmm. You know, the algorithm of um, social media continues yeah. to change. Yeah. So I study things like that because mm -hmm. I know the importance of, um, of of how that is to my brand. Like yeah. my brand literally was built off of social media. Yeah, you know, and you're so. a practitioner yourself, which yes. is that I have a huge respect for. Uh, you know, like a Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, yeah. he's doing it. Yes. Sure, he's got a team of 30 people, mm -hmm. but he's still putting his own post out there. He knows how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, he gets in the dirt with all of that stuff. So you're actually doing a lot. You're, you may freelance out some help, Absolutely. but you still know how it works and you keep trying to, to keep up with the yep. changes as it goes. Literally, right after my last meeting, mm -hmm. I literally went, had a seat, tired and everything. I literally just didn't want to do anything else, but I was like, man, I gotta really post this video. Yeah. You know, because I hadn't posted now in almost two days because yep. you the schedule here is so yep. crazy. Yeah. I said I have to, I have to post this, and sure enough. Again, I think right when you walked into the room to yeah. come get me, I had just got done posting this post that I just posted right now. So ah, cool. sometimes, you know, uh, when you're posting, you're like, oh, is this even worth it? But I promise you and guarantee you, you if there's one thing that I'd say that, you know, if people ask, like, what advice can you give me? The best advice I could give anybody mm -hmm. is honestly just be consistent. Yeah. The consistency will drive you so far you, it's yeah. unbelievable it builds that relationship it and the so trust does. Yeah. When, mm -hmm. when you're consistent with whatever it is that you're doing yeah. eventually you're going to see results you will definitely see results and you know uh there's a saying of um you know what what's you know luck right so for me it's when um opportunity means preparation when those That's two right. yep. Yep. when those two meet you're ready that's it mm -hmm. you know cuz at the end of the day it's like we could have all this opportunity, but if we've never prepared for it, yeah. then we never got lucky, right? Yeah, you never get to, to see that moment when it comes. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think, you know, again, for my brand, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for ECR because they, I've seen the uh, potential growth and I've also seen the actual growth. Walking in, I saw the potential. And then now this is, I think we're, this is probably like our fifth show. Yeah, like that. well, you read my mind. I was just going to ask you. You've been to several of our sessions. Um, <laughs> Tell us some of the wins that you've had from that. All right, so the best thing I can tell you is, like I spoke earlier, um, preparing yourself. Yeah. Understanding when we came out here to uh, Europe, we had um, you know a couple holes, I guess, that we need to patch up mm -hmm. after we left that we realized like some compliance issues, things like that, some registrations, mm -hmm. so on and so forth, because the U.S. is obviously different from, Much different from Europe. Yeah. So uh, coming in here again, I saw the potential of growth, but then now... Here we go, um, coming right back to this European show for the second time. Uh, we've actually had some growth from the first show. Uh, one of the stories I could tell you that I think was a great story was we actually were in uh, Arizona. And um, long story short, 
you know, I wanted to get into a particular retailer. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll say what it is, uh, Walgreens, okay. right? So Walgreens, uh, you know, they were one that we uh, wanted to try to build a relationship mm -hmm. with. And so our um, buyer who supplies Target for us um, had sent out an email. So then when we met with the buyer from Walgreens, uh, she basically told me, she's like, yeah, I think I just saw your email come in uh, last minute. I looked over it. And, um, but after I was done with my, uh, my speech mm -hmm. and my presentation, she said, we're basically done with uh, blind reviews. Mm -hmm. She said, but I got to tell you, she's like, your presentation, everything you told me was not on what the email that came through. She's like, I'm glad you presented to me. And if you're able to get me samples, literally like overnight, yeah. I think I may be able to get you in stores. Excellent. And that right there, I was like, what? I was like, man, I, I was just blown away mm -hmm. from the instant opportunity yeah. from a buyer that believed in the brand. Yep. You know what I yep. mean? And so, um, you know, that says a lot because a lot of times these buyers, they see tons of emails. They meet tons of people. Oh, yeah. But I think... I'm a firm believer that people invest in people. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, with buyers, a lot of times it's the same thing. They will sometimes uh, bring a line in that they believe in the brand more so than just bring a brand in because, you know, hey, we just need another brand. So it's, uh, you know, the authenticity, the um, just the passion behind it, I think mm -hmm. helps drive uh, the brands that are winning nowadays. Excellent. So last question. What are some of the things that you personally like about your ECRM experience? You know, <clears throat> what is it about it? Uh, to be honest, I think the, the first thing that I like, which I'm a real stickler about, is uh, organization. Uh, very organized, very well put together. Um, you know, again, I, for what's going on, uh, every 20 minutes, someone, a different buyer is in front of you. It's so close to like, maybe like them being exactly every 20th minute, Someone is walking in, if not maybe one or two minutes, which to me is crazy because there's over a couple hundred buyers and there's, excuse me, a couple hundred suppliers, mm -hmm. sellers, and then obviously maybe a couple hundred buyers. So you're literally having almost anywhere from 50 to 70 meetings in a three day period. So to be that organized yeah. as this like, well oiled machine that's going it's like it's impressive you know? a lot of behind the scenes work and you met yes, one of the I people met, responsible for that yeah so yeah. you know so I, I definitely gotta say you know you guys definitely got your stuff together mm -hmm. and uh, it's impressive and even when I speak to my team I you know that's one of the things that for me as a uh, you know brand owner business yeah. owner uh, it's important for me mm -hmm. is uh, you know being organized and making sure you know we follow up making sure that presentation everything is all professional because at the end of the day, you know, that first impression is the last impression. Yeah, yeah. That's the other thing. It's like, you know, any any entrepreneurs out there, any, um, you know, brands coming in. I know I met another brand of a young lady and her husband. They were fairly new. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I thought it was great for the short amount of time that they were actually building out their mm -hmm. brand, the type of success that they've yeah. had. And uh, just looking at their social media page. Swati. Uh, yeah, Swati. Yes. Swati Vern or something like that. Uh, yes, yes. And then it's, uh, he's talking about Swati Cosmetics, the eye things that yes. I was wearing. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, just, I look at all, everything from the aesthetics uh, to the, uh, you know, just uh, the professionalism mm -hmm. to just everything because I understand what it is to literally start a brand from ground yeah. zero. You know, like people don't know this, but I literally sold my car at the time. I had like a BMW, right? And um, I sold it. Well, before that, let me back up. Before that, when I got out the Navy, I literally couldn't find a job, right? Yeah. I still hadn't completed my hours to um, become a barber. So I was looking for a job, could not find a job. I moved back in, back in with my mother. My son was three years old at the time. And I literally was like, all right, what am I going to do with my life at yeah. this point, right? So I went ahead and asked my mom. I said, mom, if, you know, you would let me stay here for a couple months. I just want to finish hair school, get my license so I can be a barber. She said, no problem, you can stay here as long as you need to stay. And uh, I just remember just like never wanting to feel, you know, like broke where like I could barely feed yeah, my yeah. child, you yeah, know? And so people don't realize the investment sometimes that we make. So then I got back on my, on my feet and uh, I ended up getting to a point where I owned my own barbershop. And from there, it was just like, I wanted to focus so much on my brand that I had to stop cutting hair. Yeah. So what I did was I sold my car and for four years I had no car. 
I was just using my girlfriend's car to get back and forth. Yeah. But I was so passionate about my brand, maybe one day making it, that yeah. I, I didn't care about a car. I didn't care about going out no more. Yeah. I didn't care about getting nice clothes and things that used to matter to mm -hmm. me, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I invested about, you know, a couple thousand dollars, whatever my vehicle was worth at the time, and just put it all into, into my brand. Yeah, you know? that's the way to do it. You know, don't buy dumb stuff. You know, if you're an entrepreneur, Money yeah. count. I mean, you have Every to penny counts, that absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes you got to just dig deep and make that sacrifice uh, when you know what, what really is important. So Awesome. Well, thank you for this. This, this yeah, wasn't even fine. an interview. This was a journey. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I absolutely. really appreciate yeah. it. And appreciate uh, good luck with the uh, the rest of the session. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for having me. Uh, appreciate course, you, sir. Appreciate oh. it. Thank you.